Thank you. I'm sure many of you have heard of 23andMe and Ancestry.com. You know, those companies that volunteer to map your DNA and to draw out your family tree. But is a genetic selfie really your authentic self? <laughs> I, these lines, they're just the barest branches of your family tree, uh, just some names and dates. If you want to really know about your history, you have got to get the stories. Uh, the stories are the, the, the blood and muscle and brain and skin. Until you've got the stories, you don't know where you're coming from because home is where your stories begin. I teach a class in storytelling, identity, and culture. I say identity because the way we make sense of our lives is by telling ourselves a, a coherent plot of it. We tell stories about our lives and that becomes our identity. I saw this, I did this, and that's who I am. Uh, I ask my students as one of their assignments to try and find uh, a family story that they can share with us. Because storytelling and family history go hand in hand. Storytelling and oral history go hand in hand. Oral history is when you get the information that you need to have by hearing it, understanding it, and re repeating it back. Many cultures still use oral history as their main method. In fact, Australian aboriginals have stories that detail changing sea levels going back 10,000 years. They, scientists have been using these stories to locate meteorites there. They found one uh, story of a, a fiery sky devil, and it led them to a meteorite that was 4,700 years old, and some of these are even older. <laughs> so perhaps that explains why the word story is the biggest part of the word history. But how do these oral cultures do it? I mean, maybe that isn't the right question. What, how have we changed? With the advent of written language and then the printing press, we had to use our memory less and less. How many of you still memorize phone numbers? I don't, okay. But this technologically assisted memory comes at a cost. When you look at our lives today, we've got more things that we're trying to do. We need more vehicles to go separate places. And then we come back and we've got more TVs and more devices. And so we go into different rooms to choose between hundreds of cable channels or sources or technologies. Uh, it's just insane. And it's no wonder that in 2008, Computer World uh, reported that families today are spending more time together alone. And that families with more technologies report less satisfaction with family time spent together. And the fewer the technologies, the higher the satisfaction rate. So with all these things competing for our attention, how can a family dinner pull you away from the latest superhero special effects? Well, meat shouldn't have to compete with potatoes. But you can serve up some family stories at dinner time. In fact, the dinner table is when family stories are most often passed around. You are telling your family the experience of someone who is connected to them by genes, by blood, by tradition, by values. And family stories are a very powerful way teach family values, values like duty and responsibility, but also humor, character, and uh, community roles. If you hear a story about someone who is successful, it expands your dreams. If you hear a story of injustice, it stiffens our spines so that we know to work for important social change. But these genetic thumbprints and lists of dates and names, they are just the skeleton, the bare branches of what we need to learn. 
we have to go past those to get at the passions and the spirit and the real personality of your family. Now, she has a story to tell. Every antique store has jumbled boxes of old photos, and sadly, most addicts do too. When we let go of the stories from those people, uh, we start to lose something important. The first thing we lose is the names of those people in the pictures. Family information is not a secure commodity. It's not locked in a bank. Uh, it's very easily lost. And when you start to lose track of that, it's very hard to find your way back. I advise my students to look for the oldest person in their family because their stories go back the furthest into history and to find out what it is that, uh, that sparks them. You have to encourage your unique history. Who did you hear the story from? How did they leave their mark? Every storyteller leaves their mark on the story. It's like the fingerprints of artists. And so when you are trying to remember where you heard that story, you have to remember that you heard it from someone. And did you hear it right? The anthropologist Margaret Mead taught that for a culture to survive, it requires three generations. The parents teach the children, and the grandparents make sure they got it right. Well, when you heard that story, did you get it right? How can you tell? If you can, go back to the original source. But if you can't, maybe you can find another witness. I am here to encourage you to find and keep track of your family stories. And the way I want you to do this is I want you to become a family story detective. Detectives, they look for the clues. They dig deep and they find the witnesses and they find out what those witnesses saw, what they experienced, find out what their parents' stories were, find out what the oldest story is that's in circulation in the family. And then consider if you still remember it right. If you can't get back to that original source, find somebody else who was there because some stories expand with time and it's good to triangulate back to the actual story if you are lucky enough to still have access. So where do we start? I'm not gonna set you off on this without a map. Some sources say it's best to start on familiar ground with yourself. So what are the stories you know, okay? How did you learn them? Uh, check back. Make sure that you've remembered them well. And after you've done that, then you can move on to the next step. And that is finding out when to find stories. As I said, dinner time is where stories are shared the most, and that's the only time during the day when you may all be together in one place, actually facing each other. And so this is the time when people will benefit most from the stories. Uh, but sometimes our lives are so busy, we can't linger over the meal. Another time we can do this is holiday celebrations, when more time is being dedicated to the event. These are special times that bring back echoes of other years, of people we miss, of the way we used to do things, of why we do it this way. And stories of why are so much better answered by, uh, questions of why are so much better answered by stories because those questions and those answers have actual people that you are connected to doing the things you're doing now. And if you make those connections, you start to scurry like squirrels down the trunk of your family tree further towards your roots. So when can you find these stories? One good time is bedtime. Bedtime can always use a story. Now reading to children is wonderful and it has many benefits. But if you just can't take the duck on the truck one more time, 
why don't you surprise your child with a story they've never heard before about their mother's first day of school or how their father met his best friend. Another rich and profound time to gather stories is at funerals when the guest of honor is celebrated with more stories than at any other time in their life. I always think it's the mark of an excellent funeral if I leave wishing I had spent more time with that person because of the great stories I heard. So we know how to find these stories, but how do you unlock stories in a person? Well, you can often turn on the tap with an interesting question and excellent listening skills. Um, so maybe you start with a question about first dates or family secrets. Why should they die out? And you're going to keep them in the family. And in a couple of generations, they might be going crazy trying to find what the actual end to that story was. Uh, each family's history and experiences are unique, but there are some story types that occur in almost every family because they have important information and strong, powerful staying power. The first one is stories of migration. How did we get to here? Whether it was by train or boat or covered wagon, you, all these stories are woven with ambition and hardship, with determination and caring and supporting and what for your fellow family members, real life illustrations of your family values. There's stories of brushes with the famous and the infamous. These are stories of possibility and a little adventure, maybe some name dropping and some glamour. Stories of fortunes lost and found. Most of these stories have a moral to them. Don't trust strangers. Uh, kindness is always repaid. Um, be cautious or trust in the family luck. You'll note that any lottery ticket stories in these are never of the 292 million to the one, the one that's in the story. There's stories of characters. <laughs> stories of characters. Whether you are a model example or a warning cautionary tale, um, this is where stories of mischief pet pop up. Uh, who will be the cautionary tale in your family? Whether you, if you maybe admired an aunt or uncle and tried to model yourself on them, go back and find out if they themselves modeled themselves on someone they admired from further back. You might be just extending the tradition. Uh, finally, uh, stories of faith or the supernatural. These are stories that explain the unseen. Whether yours is a story of how faith sustains or a story of unexplainable bumps in the night, just the existence of the story justifies the possibility of that explanation. Any occasion can be improved by a story. And you never know if one story will spark a family member to tell another one and another one. I always encourage my students to seek out the oldest members. And if you do, they will get something very important out of it too. They will know that they're still listened to. They will know that they still have a place in the family story. They will know that their story is being received to go on. But there's another wonderful effect that happens in this kind of exchange, and that's called life review. For people getting on in their story, having to compose it and share it with somebody else lets them look back across it and they see the significance and the importance of it as a whole opus that they might not see in their day-to-day -day recollections. And so, 
you give them a very important perspective to take as they start to near the other end of the story. But if you're talking to them, be patient. Some quiet people like to gather the threads of their memories before they spin their tale. So try and gauge your storyteller's style. Some like to tell their stories one-on-one. -on -one. Others like a quiet audience, like you're pretty darn quiet. And others still don't mind a question or two to add color to the pattern of the story they're revealing. If you want to record videotape the stories, that's great. But videotape them being told to someone the storyteller cares about because then they'll be a gift to that person and the performance will have more profundity. I want you to remember that these are a limited resource. So once we have gathered these stories together, how do we preserve this harvest? My favorite way is to pour it into eager listeners. Listeners are co-creators of the stories. Listeners inspire the storyteller to put in more emotion, more details, tell the longer version, not the text message. And so they uh, enrich the story through their cooperation with the storyteller. So when we think about these limited resources that are the texture and the character of our family, I want you to unplug your technology and plug into the unique history that's your family. Every time uh, an elder leaves with, uh, with their stories unspoken and unheard, we lose an incredible amount of information. Every generation, the equivalence of a library of family experience is lost. Who is that person in the picture? What was their story? Have you listened to your parents' stories? When they're gone, will you be able to pass on those stories? Did you remember enough? Or do we need to call out the detectives? Thank you.